once when I was a ri riding a taxi in Bangkok. Got to talk to a very interesting taxi driver. He told me of a very vivid dream he had had one time, where he was up in heaven, looking at all the wonders that heaven had, and he was crossing a bridge over a pond. He looked down in the pond, and there were some big fish in the pond. And the first thought that went through his head was, those fish would be good to eat. And immediately, it was like the ground opened beneath him, and he fell back down to earth and woke up. Just because he'd had that one thought, he couldn't stay in heaven. The Buddha talks about living with virtuous people as a kind of heaven. He says it's like living with a deva or a devi, that's a female deva, in the house when you're living together with someone who's virtuous. And of course, to live with virtuous people, you have to maintain your virtue as well. Otherwise, the ground opens beneath your feet and you drop out. So it's good that we have the opportunity to live in a place where everybody's trying to be virtuous, trying to maintain the precepts. Where personal honor is something that's valued. There's a Jataka tale in which two swans are investigating a pond, and one of them gets caught in a trap. And the other one is faithful to the first one, refuses to leave. The hunter comes along and finds the two swans, and is surprised to find them there, that the one that wasn't trapped has not gone away. And so the one that wasn't trapped explains why he's staying, because he's being faithful to his friend, and the hunter is impressed with his virtue. We were talking about this the other day, and we commented how most people nowadays would say, you fool, and would take the two of them. But in the story, because the hunter is impressed with the virtue of the first, the second one, frees them both. It's good to live in a world where there are people who are impressed by virtue, who value it. And so that's why one of the prerequisites for living together in a good community is for everyone to have the same virtue, the same concern for virtue. Everybody values it. This creates a good place to practice. It doesn't matter whether the surroundings are poor or whether they're comfortable. As long as there's that quality of virtue, that appreciation for virtue, This is what makes a place really good to live. So this is one of the things we all have to work on, and we have to value highly in our own behavior, appreciate it in the behavior of other people. It just means we have to look after our virtue. And that's where patience comes in, because there are going to be temptations to do or say things that go against our precepts. Sometimes the temptations are pretty strong. But we have to remember those strong temptations don't stay that way forever. They eventually peter out. And so in some temptation to say something that's not quite true. that's hurtful, divisive, or just simply idle chatter, or anything that, anything that goes against saying the precepts, when it feels really strong and really tempting, remember it just st seems strong for a little while. And all I have to do is be patient. See your patience as a power. And I'm going to call it as the ultimate tapas, the ultimate sort of internal fire. And the trick to patience is 
no matter what happens, don't think about how long you have to or withstand whatever the force is. Just this moment, this moment, this moment. Can you stand it this moment? Well, yes. Usually it's because I can't think of standing this for five minutes longer. I've got to give in. That's the, the end of patience right there, because you're weighing down the present moment with your conception of the next five minutes, the next hour, the next day, whatever. Just remind yourself, this moment only has to withstand the pressure of this moment. As for the next moment, it'll have its strength to withstand the pressure of that moment. So you don't have to worry about it. Worry about only this moment, this moment. When you cut it down like that, it's a lot easier to bear things that are otherwise hard to bear. So that's a lot of the, the strength of it right there, is learning how not to weigh yourself down unnecessarily. It's typical when you go to Thailand and practice there. People will ask you, how can you stand this? You come from a comfortable place. There are all these hardships here. Well, if you don't think of them as hardships, then they don't become hardships. Focus more on the opportunity you've got to practice. It's the same with practicing the precepts any place in your practice. Any aspect of your practice that requires patience, sitting through pain, sitting through lust, anger, whatever comes up. Don't focus on the hardships. Focus on the opportunity you've got to develop skillful qualities here. Because that opportunity is not that widely available. So patience is not so much gritting your teeth and just bearing with difficult situations. It's learning how not to pile difficulty <sighs> on top of what's there. Either thinking about how long you've had to bear with something or how long you will have to bear with something. Or getting obsessed with the difficulty right here and now. All that's unnecessary extra weight placing an unnecessary handicap on yourself. In this way, whatever comes up, you find you can bear it. You can wear it lightly. This is so much of the practice here. When the Buddha talks about suffering, the Four Noble Truths, it's the suffering we place on ourselves unnecessarily. Like that old story of a, a John Swat would tell about the mountain. You know, is the mountain heavy? Well, yes, it's heavy in and of itself, but as long as you don't pick it up, it's not going to be heavy for you. And that's what matters. That's the suffering of the Four Noble Truths. The suffering that's caused by craving. Craving for this pleasure, that pleasure craving to be this or that, or craving to annihilate things that have happened, that are already there. That's just placing lots and lots of extra weight on yourself. And if you break down, who can you blame? To so look at yourself when you find yourself tempted, say, to tell something that's not quite true, or to say something hurtful, exactly where is it unbearable not to say those things? What's the great compulsion to say those things? Think about the people who in the past were much more difficult circumstances than you were, than you are now. And they didn't drop their precepts. So what's the great compulsion? In other words, a lot of patience is not simply resilience and the strength to bear up with things, but it's also the wisdom to see through these unnecessary 
burdens we place on ourselves. Even the lies we say simply because somebody gives us a funny look or we're afraid we'll look stupid in their eyes. No compulsion at all, yet there seems to be this internal compulsion, this internal, internal fear that drives us. But when you look at the actual situation, you say there's nothing there that really makes you break your precepts. It's all this unnecessary stuff you pile on top of yourself by thinking in the wrong ways or having the wrong attitudes. So when patience and endurance seem hard, turn around and look at your attitude. Look at your presuppositions. Find where they're creating the unnecessary weight. You take the, that weight off and you really realize there's nothing there. This makes patience a lot easier. When patience is easy, then the practice gets easier. <laughs>